Hi guys, Audrey here. So today we're going to try to answer the question, why is zero to the power of infinity not an indeterminate form? Um, based on what we've talked about in the past, it seems like it should be, because we've kind of talked about indeterminate forms as like battles, right? So the thing is that zero to the power of anything should be zero. And in anything, oops, anything to the power of infinity of infinity should be infinity. So it seems like maybe we should be having a similar kind of battle, like which one wins, the zero or the infinity. But in this case, we actually aren't. So to answer this question, we're actually going to start off by thinking about the form 1 to the power of infinity. We're going to do a proof of this, but first we're going to try to get some intuitive feeling as to why it's actually not an indeterminate form. So I'll just remind you, the way that we talk about an indeterminate form, an indeterminate form is kind of a form that's hiding some number. So it could take on any number in the whole world. It's just we can't tell what it is by looking at it. So for example, infinity over infinity, it could be infinity, it could be zero, it could be one, it could be 84,000, it could be e squared. We don't know because it's an indeterminate form. It's like a hiding some value behind it. Zero to the infinity is not. So let's start off by thinking about one to the power of infinity. So one to the power of infinity is an indeterminate form. And the thing that we need to understand to understand why one to the infinity is an indeterminate form is that infinity doesn't exist. So when we say one to the infinity, we mean one to the power of something that's approaching infinity. For this to even happen, we would have to be inside a limit. So what that means is it's also not just one. We have a number approaching one to the power of something getting really, really big. So a better way to look at one to the infinity would be approaching one to approaching infinity. So the first thing is, if I were to have, for example, the limit as x approaches infinity of one to the power of x, that one right there is not approaching one. It is always just one. It's like a pure one. So this right here actually is just equal to one because it's like I'm multiplying one by itself over and over and over again. But if I have something that's approaching one, that's not just a pure one, well, I could approach one from values that are bigger than one, or I could approach one from values that are smaller than one, or I could approach one by bouncing back and forth between values that are bigger and smaller than one. And unfortunately, that really makes a big difference. So if I'm like, let's go to one from values that are smaller than one, then what this means, let's think about a value that's smaller than one. So this would be like one half. One half is smaller than one. If I multiply one half by itself over and over and over again, I'm approaching zero. Whereas if I'm on the other side of one, that would be like, I don't know, let's say 1.1. So I would have like 1.1. If I multiply 1.1 by itself over and over and over again, then that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So basically what we're saying here is, depending on which side of one I'm on, I could be getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I multiply it by itself over and over again, or I could be getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I multiply by itself over and over again. But then there's also this possibility that as I get close to one, I'm actually alternating between values that are bigger and smaller than one, and then what's happening? 
don't know. So that's why this is an indeterminate form because it's hiding whatever is happening. So really when it comes to one to the infinity, it depends on how we are approaching one from values bigger, from values smaller, or from like both. Okay, so with this in mind, we understand that this is not just a pure one, we're like approaching one. Let's think about how this could apply to zero to the power of infinity. So if we're thinking about zero to the power of infinity here, well, if I'm on the right side of zero, but getting closer and closer to zero, so if I'm like zero from the right, so I'm approaching zero from the right here, should be a better arrow. So again, this is a question of not being a pure zero, but it's something that's approaching zero to the power of something that's getting really, really big. Well, what's a value that's on the right side of zero? Let's just say it's like 0 0.1. So if I do 0 0.1 by itself over and over and over again, I'm getting closer and closer to zero. I'm getting smaller and smaller. Whereas if I'm on the left, so, so on the right side of zero, that point one, as we get closer to zero, is just going to get smaller and smaller. So I'm taking smaller values and multiplying them by themselves, and that's just going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. In other words, it's going to keep going to zero. If I'm on the left side of zero, so I have something going to zero from the left, and then something getting really big on top, well, this right here, in the same way, let's say that I'm at like negative 0.1, negative 0 0.1. When I multiply that by itself over and over and over, well, in this case, it's going to be bouncing back and forth between positive and negative numbers. So like oscillating between positive and negative numbers. But those positive numbers will be getting closer and closer to zero, and those negative numbers will be getting closer and closer to zero. So as you can see, it actually doesn't matter if I'm on the left side of zero or the right side of zero, both of those values are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it turns out that the limit as x approaches infinity of some function to the power of some other function will go to zero if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x goes to zero and the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x goes to zero. So we're going to do a little proof of this now. This kind of gives us an intuitive idea as to why that zero is true. It doesn't really matter what side we're on, but we're going to do a little proof now using the e to the lawn method. So, oops. So we remember that f of x to the power of g of x is the same thing as e to the power of natural log of f of x to the power of g of x. So this is the fact that we're going to use to do a little proof to show that this thing must be zero. So here we're going to start with our assumption. And this assumption is going to tell me that the limit as x approaches infinity actually we'll just say c it doesn't even have to be an infinity c of f of x goes to zero 
and the limit as x approaches some constant of g of x goes to infinity. So in other words, the form that it's giving us is that zero to the power of infinity form. So let's say we have the limit as x approaches that constant, f of x to the power of g of x is giving us that zero to the power of infinity. So we're gonna do our little e and long thing, e to the power of limit as x approaches c, of natural log of f of x to the power of g of x equals two e to the limit as x approaches and I keep doing infinity <laughs> approaches c of g of x natural log of f of x. Okay, so remember we're going to remember to come back for that e, and we're just going to take this limit right here. Limit as x approaches c, g of x, natural log of f of x, and bring it off to the side. So that's going to be star, that's going to be star. And when we plug into this, I end up with g of x. Well, that's the limit as x goes to c of g of x we said was infinity. And then we said this is ln of, well, we have a zero right there. So remember, ln of zero, as long as we're approaching from the right, is going down to negative infinity. So this actually is a little problem with our proof because it really only works as long as we're approaching zero from the right. So we're gonna go add that back to our assumption and we're just gonna do the proof for zero from the right. You guys have the intuitive feeling for what's going on on both sides. Unfortunately, on the left side, when you get into the complex plane and you no longer are talking about real numbers, we have a few problems um, with it equaling to zero. So we're really just gonna stick to the right side here. So that is infinity times negative infinity, which gives us a negative infinity, which means, which is not an indeterminate form, that's just negative infinity, we're good, we got that. So this means that the limit as x approaches c, f of x to the power of g of x, goes to e to the negative infinity, which is approaching zero for my final answer there. So we'll just take a little look at the graph, that was ln x of the graph of e to the x to see this. So this is the graph of e to the x. Um, as it's going to negative infinity, those y values are getting closer and closer to zero. Okay, so like I said, this proof really only works if we're approaching zero from the right. Um, that said, you guys have that intuitive definition as well, or that intuitive reasoning as well, rather. So we have one last little thing to look at about this. The sign of the infinity is actually really, really important when it comes to zero to the infinity. And the reason for this is because it gives us the value zero. If I had, for example, zero to the negative infinity, well, that is effectively one over zero to the power of infinity, which we just said is zero. So that right there could end up being infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist, depending on how zero to the infinity approaches zero. Is it approaching from the left side or the right side or different on both sides? So depending on how zero to the infinity approaches zero. Okay, so to summarize, one to the infinity, we'll do this in blue, one to the infinity is an indeterminate form. And again, this is like approaching one to approaching infinity. Zero to the infinity goes to zero. And zero to the negative infinity goes to either infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. And is not an indeterminate form because it's not hiding any value in the world. It's literally hiding zero. Or if it's a negative infinity, infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist and is not an indeterminate form.
All right. Hopefully that was helpful in giving you a little bit of intuition as to why zero to the infinity is not an indeterminate form and why one to the infinity is. Bye guys.